Okay, welcome. Sorry about that technical difficulty. I guess my bit rate was sped up and I was sounding like a chipmunk. So here we go. Take two. Welcome to Taking Note, episode number 13. I'm Eddie Manessis. Today is Friday, June 26th. So more and more orchestras are canceling their seasons and their concerts through the end of the calendar year, and some have even gone so far as to cancel their entire 2020 and 2021 seasons till next summer. And it's really disheartening. Um, But, you know, it makes sense. I think I read uh, an article, a headline today from the Miami Herald that said Florida set a new record of 9,000 new coronavirus cases in one day. So I guess it makes sense not to pack 1,500 to 2,000 people into an auditorium and have 100 people blow hot air at each other for an hour or two uh, to keep everyone healthy. It makes sense, but I'm hoping that there's some type of solution so we can, uh, you know, get back to work and and perform music and make a living again. On that topic, I was thinking about putting together a panel of people who work in arts administration to see if they, um, if, you know, what, what they're doing, how they're keeping their organizations afloat, what they're doing to combat the illness and any sort of ideas that they've come up with to get orchestras and musicians back to work and making a living again. So let me know in the comments if you're interested in uh, in a topic like that, if you're interested in seeing that panel, and I will try and put that together. On that note, if you have any recommendations for someone that you'd want to see me interview and you want to see on this show, DM me and send me their name and put me in contact if you know them or just give me their name and I'll reach out. So far, the format of the show And my interview subjects have always just been someone I've worked with or met in some capacity, seen them on an interview, uh, seen them give a class, played with them, I'm actually friends with them. And that was kind of my barometer uh, for having them on my show. But I'm definitely open to any recommendations anyone has. So if you have those, put them in the comments or DM me directly. So please like, comment, and share this interview. Sharing is the number one way you can help me out in broadening my audience. Uh, Those of you who have shared in the past, it has been incredibly helpful. I really appreciate it. So if you could just take a couple seconds, hit that share button, and share this to your profile, I would really appreciate it. I appreciate it so much. Just take that one second, click that share button. Also, at any time, if you have a comment or any questions during this interview, please post them in the comments, and I will get to them at, uh, probably at the end of this interview, we'll save some time to answer all of your questions. But at any point, if a question pops in your head or a comment, please put it in the chat and we will get to it. So please like, comment, and share. So the topic today is going to be around meditation and and mindfulness and how that applies to music and how that can apply to overcoming any mental hurdles you have in performing live music. Uh, and on that note, I those of you who know me know that I have been meditating for about seven years now. And about the last year and a half, I've been using the app called Waking Up by Sam Harris. I really enjoy that app. I highly recommend it. I love Sam Harris's a kind of philosophical approach to meditation. And, and honestly, I just really enjoy the sound of his voice. I think he's a wonderful teacher. He also has some very interesting and insightful interviews with some of the world's most prominent meditation teachers. And some of those teachers have a little mini series within the app of their own meditations. So highly recommended. Those are included free of charge if you have a subscription. And there is also a a section for children that is put on by Sam's wife, Annika Harris, that teaches children as young as five years old how to meditate. It's just a really great app. And he's doing it for all the right reasons. It's a little bit pricey. It's $14.99 a month or $99.99 a year. But Sam has expressly said that he does not want money to be the thing that gets in the way of someone starting meditation meditation practice and improving their life. So at the end of a one-month trial, if you really cannot afford a subscription, which is probably many people out there due to lack of work from the coronavirus, all you have to do is email support at wakingup.com, tell them that you can't afford a subscription and they will give you a free year subscription. So I highly recommend it. If you want that free month, DM me. I will send you a link for a free month. I'm not sponsored by the app. It's just something that anyone who is subscribed gets to do. We get to give away free months of this app to anyone who wants. So please DM me. Let me know if you want to give it a try. The other ones out there are good. Headspace is good. 
Uh, 10% happier is good. I just really like Sam Harris's app. So yes, please DM me if you want a free month trial. And if you can't afford it, you can get a free year. He just really wants anyone, everyone to, to just start meditating and improve their lives. He's doing it for all the right reasons. So my guest today is a really wonderful example of triumph over adversity. As a student, he struggled mightily with severe, severe performance anxiety to a point where if you put anyone in a room with him, he could not perform. He could not play his horn. It was just too much to handle. And it got so bad that his teacher actually recommended that he quit the horn altogether and leave music, that he just stood no chance at being a professional musician. Luckily, he did not listen to his teacher and he discovered meditation began practicing meditation and went so far as to travel to India for a more intense study and started to incorporate that into his musical practice. And due to that, had a really fantastic, wonderful playing career as a performer. He is the former principal horn of the Australian Opera and Ballet Orchestra. He is the former head of brass at the University of Melbourne and the founder and director of the Melbourne International Festival of Brass, which went, ran for 10 years. And most recently, he is the founder of Aeons, which is a brand new online teaching platform that is much more than just that. And we will get to that towards the end, end of the interview. It is my absolute pleasure to bring you Jeff Collinson. Oh, hi, Eddie. Thank hi. you so much. Yes, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. I know it's uh, it's about 10 a.m. In, in, in Victoria, right, where you are? Yeah, absolutely. 10, 10 a.m. here, a lovely summer, uh, sunny winter's morning here. But, oh, that's uh, right, that's right, that's right. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much for doing this in the morning. I know you have two young kids uh, who you're taking care of, and I know you told <laughs> me that they're on screen time right now, so you can do this interview, so I really appreciate, yeah, appreciate that. So Absolutely. let's get let's get right into it. Let, let's go back to you when you were a university student and you're struggling with performance anxiety. Can, let's uh, you know, let's dig deeper into that. And I just want to hear your experience struggling with performance anxiety and how you discovered meditation. Yeah, yeah sure. I can. So my my uh, university career amounted to one year as a, a, in my uh, my study. Hmm. So I had this uh, quite. I guess, interesting pathway to the horn. I uh, actually um, was a trumpet player as a kid. That's how mm. I grew up playing the trumpet and um, left school at the grand old age of 17 and moved into the Air Force actually as a musician and as a trumpet player. That's how that was the beginning of my career. And, okay. and it was during that I uh, quickly knew that I wasn't uh, going to be suited to military life, that, that wasn't going to work. Uh, in the big picture so i uh, heard then uh, and made a 30 second decision when i found out that one of the other uh, one of the horn players was actually going to retire and i went and asked the director of music if they'd asked me or if they'd allow me to um, to change the horn which thankfully they did so hmm. that's uh, that's where that all started but when i went uh, when i finished my air force career and went to canberra actually then in uh, another state in Australia, I decided uh, I went to study with one of Australia's greatest ever horn players and a fabulous teacher in Canberra. And uh, that was my one year of, uh, of study in, in the academic world there. So I didn't finish high school and I got one year uh, through my uh, degree course when, it, when uh, it was decided quite quickly there through just uh, nerves, it just increased at such a dramatic rate. So actually, it's an interesting thing for a horn player. Being inside a military band, you are much more hidden. You, 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 you're not quite so exposed. Suddenly being in the orchestral world and playing on stage, all of those things all led to this experience of uh, um, nerves starting to really run away with me and, mm. uh, and being around really high-quality people, uh, young students, and feeling, you know, less and less confident about my own skills, all of those things. I, I, over a year, I even scraped through my first year exam then with the uh, great mark of about 51. Oh. So, <laughs> so that was when, uh, at that point, my then teacher decided, and he really is, he's one of Australia's, or he's gone, uh, uh, 
retired recently back in mm-hmm. Europe, went back to Europe after some time, and he was a, an amazing teacher. But it was just out of personal, uh, um, you know, worry about myself, really, about where it was actually going that he thought, you know, he made that recommendation to me that, mm-hmm. that I should just look for something else because I couldn't do it. But mm-hmm. I kind of knew even at that stage, if I did that, this is going to keep chasing me the whole rest of my life. And mm-hmm. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to give up. Um, I wanted to pursue it and work out how to beat it. So I dropped out Mm -hmm. and just asked him whether he would then, um, if I dropped out, would he keep teaching me privately, Uh, which thankfully he did. So I used to just pay for my lessons and go and be part of the group, but um, focused just on what I could do to um, beat this, really. It was Mm -hmm. about beating myself. It wasn't even, at that stage, it wasn't even about being, becoming a musician. It was about beating myself. That's Mm. really what I wanted to do. Can you you go into how it kind of manifested itself when you would get nervous? I couldn't, Eddie, I couldn't stand. One of the big things, and even then when I went on to become head of brass here at the conservatorium, performance class, if it's not done the right way where you get in front of your peers every week and you start performing, if you're not, if you're feeling a lack of confidence and suddenly, you know, all this feedback is going to come back. All of these things are going you know, people are actually going to say something to you and that's in your mind when you're mm-hmm. playing, it just cripples you. So literally at the mm-hmm. end of end of that time, I, I, I absolutely still have a vivid memory of people in that class actually laughing mm-hmm. at, at different about, when I stood up to try to play something, I couldn't play it. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'm, young people are young people. I'm sure they didn't mean it. In, uh, but, but to a um, person that I was in the, you know, the state I was in at that time, that was actually quite crushing. So, and, and still here I am, you know, many, many years later, and I yeah. still remember that. Yeah, that's uh, those kind of traumatic events kind of stick with you like that uh, for yeah. a long time. Yeah, absolutely. So I had to. Uh, start the process of actually repairing that because I just uh, I refused to be beaten mm-hmm. I didn't want and one person I didn't really want to be beaten about uh, beaten by was myself and uh, if I didn't start that journey at that point uh, I was never going to you know we just come back and bite you wherever you went really uh, perhaps in different ways but I wanted to start that journey so that that's where I ended up uh, exploring different types of meditation and I came across this lovely group that I studied with in Canberra um, which had a very different type of meditation it was actually eyes open meditation that Mm. I learned at that stage which proved for that purpose to be incredibly helpful because it gave me the the ability to actually understand what was going on in my mind with building the capability of not being distracted with what was going on externally so mm-hmm. understanding that between the physical and the and the spiritual or mental whichever way you want to think right so that that but for that and there were actually many many at that time many famous australian musicians uh, you know that i started meeting through this meditation who are still oh. friends and are actually on aeons too which is really oh. interesting that's really <laughs> wonderful yeah, we yeah, see that yeah. that eyes open practices in the in a lot of the Zen practices. They they keep their eyes open. I, mean, I did a retreat once yeah. where we had to keep our eyes open. And yeah, that was very that was novel for me at the time, and it's um, yeah. certainly a way to incorporate the mindfulness into your daily life, right? So uh, I know That's, that people people will struggle. They'll, they'll they'll be able to meditate on the mat, but as soon as they go into their life, they struggle with you know, intrusive thoughts, all of that stuff. And so I feel like the eyes open practice is a really great way to kind of transition from the mat to real life and, and, and incorporate mindfulness into your daily routine. Yeah, totally agree, Eddie. And uh, so that that practice for that time, which I did for very close to 10 years, um, without that, no doubt, I never would have become a professional musician. I can say mm-hmm. that categorically. It's not something I've kept going with that group, you know, for a long time now, but uh, I am so grateful for the time uh, that I spent with them, what I learned with them, the time I spent in India. Um, I spent, uh, went to every year, seven years in a row. I actually went uh, off to India and spent anywhere between four to six weeks in India 
on the top of Mount Abu in Rajasthan and, uh, uh, you know, uh, in incredibly deep contemplation, basically, and trying to understand how my mind worked and how I could then use that. I mean, it, this was a more of a whole life thing, but that mm -hmm. kind of naturally trans uh, transitioned into what I was doing with my practice and how that uh, led to improvement uh, and gradually be you know for me it was a deep problem it took six or seven years to mm -hmm. to actually do I, I still remember to this day sitting in a a uh, rehearsal room in sydney and looking around and going my god i'm the principal horn of the opera <laughs> How the hell i still remember it thinking oh, it, it so it worked and and, and I, I know it's a really weird thing to say you, you but it, uh, it it seems like you, you didn't understand what you're doing and, and to some degree it only it took me more time after that to really deeply understand the effect of what i'd been doing and the processes on on how that reflected then in my music and being able to go ahead and not only win a job but you know play that job for 10 years because there's right. there's uh, there's winning the job there's staying in the job yeah you know, yeah that's a big part of it and uh, and opera you know principal horn and opera is no no easy task a lot of huge solos night after night yeah, yeah. absolutely it's so, uh, it, it's sorry so I'll go uh finish your thought if you if you want i was just going to uh you know the opera repertoire quite often by young horn players is just not understood everybody knows helden laban and mm -hmm. uh, all the you know symphonic repertoire but uh, quite often i used to find all the time you know when i was uh, full-time teaching the kids just didn't understand what was in the opera repertoire and how actually probably the majority actually of our most amazing solos are in the opera repertoire mm -hmm. yeah so can you go back to the time when you when you were really intensely studying meditation maybe you're in india for those four to six weeks or maybe you're back home doing your own daily practice what did you discover about yourself? Uh, what were some kind of big groundbreaking moments where you discovered why you were feeling this way or what was going on in your mind and then how you kind of overcame that or were able to put that aside while you performed? Look, uh, uh, the crux of the journey for me as a musician was understanding where my mind was when I was practicing. I, I used to practice so much. When I was in the military band, I would rehearse with them for three hours a day, and then I would practice for another three hours every afternoon. So I, was, I had the horn on my face for six hours. So it wasn't mm -hmm. that I wasn't practicing. When I went to Canberra, same thing. It wasn't a matter of uh, intense amounts of practice. But what I discovered very quickly is what I was doing with my mind while I was practicing. Mm. So where my mind was when I was practicing was far more important than how long or what I was practicing. Okay, and let's put a let's put a big big emphasis on that. That is a really incredible concept that I think a lot of people are just unaware of. So just to repeat it's, that, you, it, it's it, not about you would practice for hours, and it wasn't about the hours. It's where your mind is while you're doing that work. Absolutely, the, the, the number one thing, the number one thing, because if your mind, so we have this whole thing, very important in, in and we're all talking and thinking about today about goal setting and being able to, you know, see your future and create your future. Absolutely, it, it, it's totally um, important to do that. But if you're, seeing even in short-term events so you've got your end of year exam or an audition or something coming up and your focus is has gone from actually the enjoyment of it and what you want to feel in that situation and the emotions that you actually love about music and the passion you have for music and you're actually doing the reverse and you're practicing feeling nervous in that situation inadvertently without actually even realizing you're doing it but if your mind is and you're constantly seeing uh, the reverse to what everybody's talking about and which actually the majority of people I think do so you're sitting in a practice room, you've got your technical exam or you've got your audition and you're focusing in your mind and then actually seeing that hall, seeing that room and actually practicing a feeling of 
the tension and the nerves, mm. it, 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 it's not rocket science. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you get to that point and you amplify it. When you get to that point, it's only going to amplify. And then, of course, what, what happens is, uh, you know, tends to extremes. And that, that's what I was doing. Predominantly, I was mm -hmm. actually practicing. In my mind, I was I had the hours there, but there was a tension, and, and and everything even relates then in your physical body. But when in my mind, the uh, what was happening, and the most important thing was the nerves and the thoughts and the panic. Even though you might be getting it right, you mm. might be actually playing right and and well in your mm. in, in practice, but you had to do it one more time. I've got to do it one more time mm. because I'm practicing it with fear. I'm not mm -hmm. practicing it because I love it. I'm not playing it because I love it. I'm playing it because I'm worried. <laughs> and even right. if I'm getting it one more time, I've got to do it one more time. I'll do it again. I'll just go through it again. And so go, and repeating and repeating and repeating is great if your mind's in the right place. Mm. But actually, funnily enough, I, I, I found later in my career that repeating it suddenly disappeared because I've just, you know, as soon as there's a knowledge or a feeling uh, and you've been practicing it the right way that you know it's going to work, the fear disappears. Right. It almost gets to a point where if you if you do too much repetition, it's kind of overbaked, right? And and you're overworked and, and you become yeah. more and more nervous. It just kind of feeds that nervous cycle. It's like, okay, well, I played it this many times in a row, but what if the next one is bad? The what if when I have to do it on stage, it's the, that's the bad one, right? So... Exactly. So we, how, we, it, what were your techniques for getting around that, those thoughts? It's, it's really is uh, understanding that the primary thing you need to be working at, and it takes practice. This is the practice. Mm. This isn't the practice. Mm. <laughs> this is the practice that every time uh, it, when you're playing and actually practicing the mental focus, it, it, it just doesn't get done enough uh it, it's the hard thing so people ignore it but that's actually where the focus is and understanding that the the feeling the passion the working at internalizing these things uh, uh while you're playing your instrument is actually incredibly important mm -hmm. it's incredibly the most important thing you do mm -hmm. a simple thing uh that that uh, i used to do and i used to get people who were um suffering for nerves first can you actually pick up your instrument first thing whether it's your mallets or whether it's a horn and actually hold them and feel the passion that you used to feel when you're a young person or do when you pick them up and even hold them do you feel that tension come back into your body or the the, the nerves come back into your body and and so it, it actually gets to that point sometimes where you, as soon as you pick up your instrument you can feel that come back in before you've played a note. So mm -hmm. actually just holding your instrument and letting that release and think, my God, there's, there's a reason I'm standing here with this. I actually loved it. I love it. That's why I'm doing it. I mm -hmm. want to be a musician because I love it. Even just that simple thing in the first place is actually very, very important so, yeah. because it's going to base how you, how and why you're practicing in the first place. So that, that simple fundamental thing right from the very beginning and then working at where your mind is at all times when you're practicing. If it's not in the right place, if you're actually thinking about what you're going to have for dinner or your mind's actually off in, a, in another place where you're thinking about that hall or that place that's coming up and you can feel the tension, put the damn thing down. Just mm -hmm. stop. Refocus and then go back. And that, that for me... That was what I was doing through that period of time. And I actually didn't even know it. It was actually what was taught in the meditation. And it just sort of uh, started ingraining itself in my habits, in my practice. Right. The, the concept of beginning again when you're distracted by a thought Correct. in your meditation practice. Just taking a deep breath and, and starting the Correct. next moment as if you're just starting your practice again. Yeah, I, I've actually I've struggled to incorporate that into my practice. I, I'm relating to you so much because I will often find myself playing something and then realizing, yeah, I'm thinking about dinner or I'm thinking about uh, a discussion I had with somebody or I'm thinking about my next interview and I'm like, oh man, uh, I am not here and I need to be here. So you're talking about that first moment when you pick up the horn and you're trying to feel that that love for the instrument, that love, would you sometimes kind of 
have to convince yourself of that because I, I can see myself and other people, I can see uh, picking up my sticks saying like, I love percussion. I mean, I'm doing this. I've been doing this for 27 years because I love it. And then another voice in your head saying like, do you really? Is that true? Uh, are you good enough? Is that true? You're, are you trying to convince yourself like, you know, that kind of chatter that is that kind of negative cycle telling you uh, to not believe yourself or, or that you don't yeah. actually believe what you're saying? It's not, it's not even convincing yourself. It's just so the, the majority of that has come through the negative experiences or experiences that actually started imprinting themselves in the, in India, they call it the sanskaras or the, the, the sort of things that are actually uh, imprinted on your mind over repeated actions. Mm -hmm. So really what, what has to happen, if that's, if that's what's actually imprinted in your mind over a period of time, it wasn't there in the first place. It's something that's actually been imprinted, that negativity. So right. what you it have to learn somewhere. On, exactly. Yeah. So what you have to do is, well, firstly, underneath is what you were and what your your original love that's actually there for and passion for music that's actually there so it's not it's not even relearning it in a way but it's just actually making sure that the habits that you do uh, are, are consistent and working out uh, understanding that um, these other things are, are quite as I mentioned for me you know some of those things were quite powerful in terms of you know how they affected me at that time that mm -hmm. those experiences of having people laugh at you or what, whatever they are for, mm -hmm. for, for you so uh, without even knowing what I was doing at the time I was actually starting to build up you know reverse thoughts over mm -hmm. the top of it about the passion I had for music and love and uh, listening and getting back into us just spent enormous hours listening 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 to music and finding things be it you know because again I came from a from a trumpet and a military band background so, mm -hmm. so suddenly for me find things like Mahler one and Beethoven seven and all these symphonies that I was going my god as a horn player mm -hmm. I could get to play that right. that you know suddenly all of these things started building this this different landscape in my mind different amount of information because really it stems to information in your mind <laughs> yeah it's it, it, it's building up information that gives you a whole set of different things to see in your mind without that information if you I only had this narrow band of you know if i muck that up they're going to listen to me I, and i only knew this small limited bit of repertoire but the more i actually expanded the repertoire the knowledge about even the history of the horn, all of these things, all of this knowledge suddenly gave me much more in my mind to understand about my instrument, the passion for my instrument, the understanding of how to actually learn that piece that I was learning. So I stopped just learning one line of my piece. I started listening to the entire thing and going, ah, oh, now I understand where that fits. And mm. all, all of these things started changing the degree, the amount of knowledge, the amount and where my focus then went. So I, I learned, as I uh, mentioned before, I, I came to the horn quite late and was about 17 or 18 years old. The horn, everybody tells you it's the hardest instrument. And I honestly think that's uh, rubbish. The, the, <laughs> any instrument is hard. Well, uh, you know, I come at it from a slightly different view. The horn is the hardest instrument if you're trying to learn how to hear using the horn if you can't if you're using the horn to develop your oral studies it's a very difficult instrument and so a lot of my nerves and difficulties came because i was trying to learn how that line of music went because my oral studies hadn't been you know very deep using the horn it's mm. tricky mm -hmm. <laughs> you can slip and slide all over the place mm -hmm. so filling all that other gaps in even as it is for, for any musician is incredibly important and, and so it got to the point even within my teaching that i used to tell people if, if you're not listening at least two twice the amount of time per day than you're playing you don't get it mm. sort of sort of figuring out where you fit in and how you contribute to the pieces of the whole rather than oh my gosh i have this big solo coming up this is all about me absolutely yeah we had that theme la in my interview last week same same concept figuring mm -hmm. out how you can contribute to the ensemble rather than 
being in your own head in your own bubble mm-hmm. kind of with feeding your ego needs exactly it, it's it's absolutely crucial all these things all build to the whole yeah. in terms of how you feel and what you have in your mind so if you go into an audition with that landscape in your head rather than this you're just having learned one line you have a completely different thing going on in your mind you ha- you know you can hear what's coming up before your excerpt and you, you know what's going out the other side it's just mm-hmm. one small piece of a whole mm-hmm. whereas you don't have that which which i didn't i was just learning one line uh, mm-hmm. you know before i sort of started this you you um it doesn't relate to anything. It's like an actor learning one line out of out of a play without understanding context from every other thing. And you, you can say mm-hmm. a big brown dog in many ways, mm-hmm. according to where it fits in. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the other actors and music's absolutely no different. Mm-hmm. Obviously, I mean, we're all no doubt the majority of us are musicians on, online here this morning. I'm sure everybody understands that. But how that relates all of this in terms of what your what you have in your mind when you're practicing and the depth that you have is really really crucial. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And and it's difficult. It's a difficult concept, especially I feel like I don't know if this is the same anymore. But I know in my training. Uh, it was very, I don't, know, I don't know if militaristic is the right word, but it was very much technique oriented. They definitely encouraged us to listen, but it was all about just kind of nailing this one little spot. And, and it's hard to kind of grapple with the fact that you don't need to be playing the entire time when you're practicing. There's so much more crucial practice that's being done in your head and listening to the piece as a whole beyond playing. And I think a lot of people struggle with, with that concept of not like time on the horn or time with the sticks in your hand, yeah. actually moving your body. And, um, yeah. that's something I certainly didn't know for a long time. Well, l- listening has to be seen uh, as your practice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this is why I, I go for me, we've had our little children, um, doing the Suzuki method for exactly that reason, um, where, where you actually learn by ear first and, uh, and then learn to read music because, you know, it's how we learn to talk. Right. Imagine somebody teach you how to, how to write right. and then saying, and then say, oh, good. you know, you, you couldn't do it that way. If you mm-hmm. can't actually hear it, your body forms the various shapes to actually talk, that's how we do it. And, mm-hmm. uh, um, but, we get, you know, I wasn't taught that way. I was getting taught back to front as well. You, you know, you're learning music while you're learning the trumpet. You're learning to read it, and it's uh, so much stuff going on right. uh, for me. Right. Me. Um, but, and then on top of that, when you moved it to the horn, I was trying to learn how to hear accurately, <laughs> playing one line, playing an instrument that's slippery. Right. Well, you know, if that's not a recipe for da- disaster, you know, tell me what is. <laughs> but so all, those things all combine then to me with the meditation and, and learning, okay, I can bring my mind back to that place. I bring my mind to that place. Mm-hmm. It, it is hard work. Mm-hmm. It is. Mm-hmm. But do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, can, it, it's, I, know, I know conceptually, you know, uh, definitely easier said than done to bring your mind back, right? Once you're distracted, a lot of people might be asking, what does that mean to bring your mind back? What does that feel like? Can you kind of talk about what it's like for you when you're playing and then you get distracted and you notice you're distracted and need to bring yourself back? What that process is like, what it feels like and what you're actually doing to bring yourself back, like a a technique you might use. It's probably going to vary a little bit for each person. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. Certainly. But actually going through, this is perhaps where, so this, uh, I, I put an article up myself about, um, that, that, that I wrote some time ago about opening doors. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and, and where, where that relates to me, I, I, I think a lot about life now, about being opening doors. That's my whole thing. I, I refuse to be beaten by anything. I can't stand it about myself, mm-hmm. <laughs> not about anything else, about myself. And sometimes with these things, we're all looking for the 
for a, a magic signal or something so that that is just going to fix a problem. And it, it, it's not like that. So when you understand some of these things, in my feeling, in my opinion now, going through this effort in your practice of actually just bringing, so if I'm starting a piece, I'm starting to practice for me Strauss one, keeping my, uh, doing all the things I've done, I've done all my work, I'm trying to listen, I'm listening as much as I can, I know the orchestral parts, I know where the cello parts, I'm filling it all in in my mind, I can hear the bits that I'm going to be listening to, and, try, and maintaining my focus for as long as I can in my practice and keeping it going as far as I can on the depth of this music and where I'm hearing my part and all parts, if my mind wanders off, I go back. Mm. I stop and I go back. And I rest, you rest. It's no, You don't just go, oh crap, go back to the beginning again. Mm -hmm. You stop, you refocus. You might want to start no, not right back at the beginning, you can start wherever it is but then I refocus and I do the thing again. And that practice, just doing that alone, schlocking through the hard stuff, it actually reaps results just like anything else reaps results mm -hmm. if you do that. Mm -hmm. If you, But it, it, it's too easy. I mean, for a while it, it might take you know some time before you go, oh, crap, I've, I'm off doing something else. Yeah. It takes a little while to be able to do it. But actually, there's no other way around it. Uh, you've seen, no doubt, so many of the different meditation um, systems around the world where if you get it wrong in some of the Buddhist techniques, you get a great, if they see you moving forward, you get a great whack with a stick over mm -hmm. the back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no it's, it might sound a, a weird thing, but sometimes there's no other way through it other than actually pushing through suffering, pushing mm -hmm. through annoyance. There is, there is actually no other way through. You have to right. open the door and keep each day expanding your capabilities and building through it, and suddenly you just find, whoa, that, that's a whole other level now. A door's open through there, and I can actually maintain it, and wow, what an insight you know, mm. that was. And then you, you go through it again. It, 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 it's pushing through, opening the door to the next level, to the next right. level, to the next And, and I still remember... Um, in my opera days, there was this story I related about um, uh, in, in, in this uh, page I was asked to write on a book about um, Julius Caesar, which was a big article, a uh, big, sorry, um, it's as close as you're going to get in a concerto for a horn in an orchestra, where it's just the uh, principal horn and, and, a, um, and the countertenor singing uh, an aria from Julius Caesar. Hmm. That was a very formulative thing for me. After a few years in the orchestra, it came at the right time, mm -hmm. and, and it became a very big thing for me, having you know opened that door into the pit to go back in and play this thing. It meant a lot to me. Mm -hmm. And then other experiences for me in, in my time there where there was another opera called Ariadne of Naxos by Richard Strauss, a smallish orchestra by Strauss standards, only two horns and two other brass instruments, bass, trombone and trumpet of all things. That it's is really small. I'm surprised there weren't 10 horns yeah. in the pit there. Exactly. It's very unusual orchestration. Yeah. But I remember a very, it's my most profound memory of my musical life. That afternoon, for some reason, I, 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 lay, I used to rest before these big pieces every afternoon, but I listened to the entire opera. Mm -hmm. that afternoon with headphones on and it felt I had this incredible experience that evening going into the pit and just feeling that the whole thing just played through my mind the whole night and mm -hmm. I always loved playing it it was it's a magnificent horn part to play mm -hmm. um, magnificent piece but I never forget getting to the end of that piece going that that the entire thing just felt like this piece of magic like a dream wow and i still remember the conductor coming down that night going my god jeff just grabbing my hand going I, you, you wouldn't hear that played anywhere like that in the world and wow. i you know uh, the, uh not showing off because that you know compared to many of my students i i was 
a, a very good horn player, but nothing like what some of my others, you know, like Andrew and people mm-hmm. have gone on to do. And, you know, Andrew being made. the principal horn of the LA Phil. Yeah, yeah but, the, you know, they're, they're in a totally different league to me. But that experience just lived, that's still like those other things now. That's a much stronger experience for me. That mm-hmm. lives and something I'll never forget. Yeah, that and that's really amazing to hear that story. I mean, that, that just brought me so much joy to hear it. I, I you know, I, I feel like I live for those experiences. I feel I don't, I feel like me personally, I don't quite have control over that yet, but I feel like I'm getting there. And I, and I really love that concept of just uh, op- the, the kind of, of opening doors, like continuing to open doors and the practicing where if you realize you're distracted, you stop and you go back to when you were distracted and not only are you reinforcing the notes, but you're reinforcing your focus over and over again. It's kind of, you're getting a two for one deal there. So that's, those are really wonderful concepts that I hope, I hope everyone starts to incorporate in their practice. I know I certainly am well, for sure. It really, you suddenly go from a different thing in your practice then. You're not thinking about just time and notes and the amount you play. It's what you're doing while you're doing it. That mm-hmm. is the key you'll find that that reflects really quickly in terms of your development and mm-hmm. particularly the focus, you know, understanding then with this, you know, how, how that relates to these supposed pressure moments is really interesting uh, and the experiences you start gaining in those things uh, and, and the feeling that, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open this door. I'm, I'm not avoiding anything ever again in terms of the, the gigs, the auditions, anything I take on, open that door, open it and walk into it hmm. and work work through these issues And uh, because it's only through doing that that you actually, that the, the personal development starts. Yeah, the, those, to, issues, I, those issues will not go away until they finish teaching they you what they're meant to teach you. Yeah. Absolutely. Just keep opening the door, moving on to the next thing and... and um, you know, do it with knowledge and understanding, but not no matter what the hell happens. It's not to say that over that six or seven years for me, where I went from zero and ended up, you know, sitting in there having that experience, going, "My God, I want a mm-hmm. job out of that." Happen. Mm-hmm. It's not to say that I didn't. Uh, I had lots and lots of boom, 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 boom. You know, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards over that time. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I just. I don't know. For me, I, I, I can't stand being beaten by myself. Can't yeah. stand it. You know, and, and that thing of uh, just keeping opening doors and it's kind of, you know, it's kept going on in my career no matter where I've gone and kind of why but the sort of things that I love to teach people when I was teaching and lucky to have people, you know, playing in lots of different places all around the world from, from that era and why I left and went into different things because I wanted to try and uh, find avenues. Uh, uh, some of the education system to me, I'll be c- completely honest. As I said, I, I got picked up here as Melbourne as the head of brass at the conservatorium. But in a time when a mug like me who actually doesn't even have a music degree could do that. Right. Um, now, I couldn't. If I don't, if you, obviously, if you don't have a master's of music or PhD now, mm-hmm. there's no way I'm getting that job anymore. I couldn't even get it. But we built that department up from 17 or so people to about 70 in a couple mm-hmm. of years mm-hmm. through uh, bringing in inspired people to, to you know, teach how to get, how to get, <laughs> how to yeah. be your best. Yeah, I am also seeing that here, that kind of odd focus on, on academic performance rather than someone who is a complete musician. Uh, yeah, it's certainly a little concerning, I suppose. And I guess while we're on that topic, let's talk about your newest venture in, in Aeons, the online teaching platform. I know we were discussing before we got on here that that you aim for it to be much more than just teaching someone on an online platform. So can we, let, let's go into that and how this mindful practice and these mindfulness techniques, how you'd like to incorporate those into this teaching platform. So look, it's, we, we've been going, I, I left uh, the university in about 2007, 2008 to try and, you know, even uh, I was way ahead of the curve and, and took a massive risk as I, 
had no idea. I, did, I couldn't even tell you what the word cash flow meant in those days. And here I was going to launch myself into something to try and work out how to solve what I saw as these problems with education online. And, mm. you know, it repeatedly kept coming back to me. I kept looking. I, I, I'd see kids, particularly children from rural and regional Australia, coming into audition each year. And they didn't uh, quite often because of the practices. I don't know what it is in the US, but at the end of six months here, you do a technical exam. And then the end of the next first six months, uh, you know, the next six months, you do your first year recital. Some of these kids, you couldn't take them in. If you had a whole year to actually develop that young person as a as a, an individual and focus on them as an individual and their individual needs, uh, yes, they could do amazing things. But I couldn't bring them into the system because it was highly likely they were going to fail at the end of six months and then highly likely they'd fail at the end of the next six months mm -hmm. because I couldn't give the focus on that or our teachers couldn't give the holistic approach that you needed to give that person who maybe hadn't even learned once from somebody who was on their own instrument. They'd been taught in rural and regional Australia by multi-instrumentalists. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at a ridiculous problem going, this is crazy. What's this about? You know, I came here thinking I was coming to a centre of learning, but I'm, I'm actually not. I'm coming to you know, repeating the same old stuff over and over again to people. And I don't I don't believe in that. So I wanted to go and try and find ways online to to fix that problem. And I guess after, you know, nearly 10 years now, Aeons is the result or the beginnings of the result of that. We, we started this platform to allow musicians to teach live online into China. That was a fundamental thing of it because China is obviously such a, a massive market. And that's where I saw the possibility of, developing this business uh, and but when COVID hit and we had the platform we had all these things we decided to open it up and let uh, hopefully provide an avenue um, for musicians to develop some sort of revenue uh, uh, you know capability of um, replacing some of the revenue that they'd lost mm -hmm. now we've started really from scratch with that and it's you know just starting to wind up and doing all the things we're doing but the big picture of Aeons and what we're really, you know, ultimately looking at is creating a, 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 a rather than, you know, just somewhere where you can go book lessons with great musicians, that the entire platform will be uh, built around taking young musicians on a journey, or not just young musicians, but musicians on a journey. So being able to build relationships with their stars, the people that they admire when they come in and building a process then where they can actually build their musical journey through achievements and on a whole bunch of different levels um, where they feel empowered by what they're doing with their practice. They can practice through their Aeons app or, or the website. They can do but and, and gradually see uh, you know the, the the various things that actually lead them on a journey as a musician, and that that's our ultimate aim. And providing information like what we're talking about. Yes, you can study. You can study the pieces. You can study musicians. Uh, study with uh, great musicians with those pieces, learning repertoire, but also providing information about how to practice, how to practice well, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and what what should my focus be? How do I actually you know, from the very fundamental days of my practice, what what helps in a, in in the structuring of my practice and the yeah it, look there's a, it, you have to be careful because there's not there's there's a certain this is with my teaching I don't didn't and don't go and talk to people about meditation as such mm -hmm. because it's not the way you talk about it to some people they don't want to know about meditation some people that word freaks out but you can talk about how that process works without even directly med mentioning it into, because actually the talk type of practice that I was mentioning before with that degree of focus, it's meditation. <laughs> it is. Yeah. So yeah. you can talk about how to practice, how you use your mind, how you're doing these things, and you don't even have to mention the word meditation. You don't mm. need to do it. So you <clears throat> understand the practices, the best way to actually uh, you know, develop and, and you know inform all the information in your mind uh, to become the best and uh, holistic musician you possibly can. And you don't even need to mention that word, but that's what ultimately um, you know we're building towards in Aeons as a as a very holistic approach to music instrumental education. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm very much looking forward to that. I I appreciate. Um, I forget who, I think Elise Henry put us in touch and that's how I met you and became a member of Aeons. And I'm really looking forward to how that, uh, 
how that goes forward. It's really, it was very promising and very exciting, especially with the, the capabilities that you're, you're exp- you've expressed that, will be there in the future. It's very exciting. We're, we're working as fast as we can towards this. And, uh, that that's what's going to you know that that's what's completely in my mind it just obviously this all takes money and you know the focus and the relationships and everything to do but that's where we're uh, where we're headed and uh, it's uh, you know, looking extremely positive at the moment in terms of the direction we're headed and the interest we're getting from a whole bunch of uh, international folks at the moment so it's it's very exciting mm-hmm. great we have uh, one question and that is uh, from the audience, how do you achieve work-life balance? Did meditation help? Uh, y- yes, absolutely, hundred uh, percent. And it's um, it, it's something I don't even know how to put this one. I, I've never really struggled with that hmm. because I, I don't. Mm, how to put it clearly. I think what I learned through the meditation is that there's not really, I, I don't find a difference between the two. I, I, I actually, just, I think there's life. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, I think um, the most important thing for me on any level is this opening doors. And, and whatever I'm doing in my life, either in music or in uh, in what you'd think of, you know, for me, I guess at the moment it's business and, and anything else. It, it, it actually just involves opening doors. Wherever I open the door and I go, okay, I, I feel crappy about this, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to actually walk through that door, whether it's actually just a, a funny thing about how you feel in a personal relationship or a funny thing you're having with the children. Uh, it can be some simple stuff like that about, okay, I, I've, I'm just going to walk through that door. I know I don't need to feel like that. I know I don't need to actually, um, uh, you know, react angrily to the kids because they're doing this. I can actually walk through that door. I don't have to feel like that. And if mm-hmm. I walk through that door, it's just surprising how that affects everything. So if I do that there, if I, wherever I'm, whatever I'm doing in my life, I I just found the effect then even on my music. And and so it's all for me, this is, I can only talk about myself and my personal experience. It's, it's just doors. It's opening Mm -hmm. doors and walking through the next door, wherever that is. And then, so I don't distinguish really between my work life balance in that way. It's just parts of life. Mm. And, and finding things that I just refuse to be knocked down by. Right. So wow. I hope that makes sense. I don't know without yeah. sounding. No, it, it's just bringing that concept of op- that opening doors concept and, and uh, addressing things head on, either musically or in life. It, it's, uh, it works yeah. in either situation. Well, Jeff, I really enjoyed hearing your stories. Thank you so much for sharing them with us. And thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, absolute pleasure. Thank you, Eddie. I um, hope that was some help to people. Oh, of course. It was lovely. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, have a good rest of your morning. Thank you. Thank okay. you, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to that episode. Again, you know, we're seeing this recurring theme of getting outside of your ego and and seeing how you can contribute to an ensemble as a whole. It's not all about that one line of music you're playing, you are part of a greater organism and, and you can really find joy in that mentality, taking yourself outside of your ego. I think those techniques are wonderful noticing when you're distracted. This is very difficult because I struggle with this, but when you're practicing, noticing when you're distracted and not just saying whatever and keep playing, like actually stop, take some time, go back, refocus and do it again. That is just as essential as playing all the right notes. So I hope everyone can incorporate that into their practice routine. And again, if you would like to uh, get into a meditation practice and you would like some help with that, please send me a DM and I will send you a free month subscription to the Waking Up app. It's a really wonderful meditation app. If you're into that, please DM me. 
I will be back here next Friday, same time, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Hope to see you then. Until then, be safe and bye for now.